Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the WIAA Zoom meeting. Uh, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. McGuine in a little bit, and then we will be opened up to question and answers. What I will ask everyone to do, uh, if you could please, is to go to the chat room, type in your name, your school, and your position. And then if you're a media, uh, we would like you to type in your name and the affiliation you have for the media. And we would just like to have, you, again, your name, your school, and your position. And we just wanna be able to um, address you in that manner. In addition to that, um, we will be taking questions and answers and Todd will go through that process. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and we will post it on the WIA website. We have a, a plan to have a one hour presentation. We've allotted Dr. McGuine 20 minutes and then we'll have some questions and answers after that. Todd, if you could go through that process, uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Wade. Yeah, I'll be moderating the questions uh, during the meeting. Please use the chat option to type in your questions. Once Dr. McGowine completes his presentation, I'll begin presenting the questions by starting the questions from school administrators first, and then we'll open it up for the questions uh, submitted by the media. We will attempt to get through all the questions as uh, provided by 11 a.m. as much as we can. Again, please identify yourself uh, with your question. And uh, we will, again, be submitting it through the chat and I'll be reading that. And please, uh, we ask to remain mute uh, during the call. Thanks. And now I'd like to introduce Dave Anderson, the Executive Director of the WIAA. Dave. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, and you have already met uh, Dr. Wade Lebecki, who has uh, uh, moderated this and put together this call for us. First off, uh, the primary and initial focus and intent of, of bringing all of us together uh, stems from our recognition that all of you uh, as school district uh, leaders are hearing the same questions and the same challenges as are we. Uh, and they can range from how can you even think of trying to reopen schools? How dare you think of reopening schools and, and bringing kids back together. Uh, we, we know and understand that uh, there are many perspectives held on this topic. One of the, I think, important parts of how we might begin to respond to those who express those sorts of concerns are based on what we are beginning to see emerging as far as the impact upon. And, documented, uh, researched, uh, you know, impact of uh, these school closings and separations upon all students. I recognize that here at the WIAA, our primary responsibility is to uh, create uh, guidelines for a regular season and to create a tournament opportunity for this membership. But we also recognize that student athletes are representative, no different from the rest of their, their you know, uh, friends and, and fellow students in your school. And so what is impacting upon student athletes, and while that may be our primary focus, our initial research by Dr. McGuine, we recognize that the impacts are far broader than just on sport. So we have Appreciate those, uh, those of you who have made time on relative short notice. We put this together following the, uh, the presentation that we made to the State Assembly Education Committee last week, which I have shared with all of you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Walter. Uh, Dr. Walter is the chairperson of the WIAA's Sport Medical Advisory Committee. Uh, Kevin works at the Medical College of Wisconsin and Children's Hospital, Wisconsin, where he is the program director of Children's Wisconsin Sport Medicine. He is the co-founder of their nationally known, con con nationally recognized concussion program. And Dr. Walter has served a term on the National Federation of High Schools Sport Medical Advisory Committee. 
while currently sitting on the Executive Committee for Sports Medicine and Fitness with the American Academy of Pediatrics. While clinical care is his primary focus, he is often involved with policy and government affairs on behalf of Children's Wisconsin and his service to the WIAA. He has given many presentations from the local to international level and has had numerous publications on concussion and pediatric and adolescent sport medicine. And we're grateful to have Dr. Walter uh, able to join us today. Kevin? Thank you. And thanks for everyone for being here. I uh, appreciate all of your interest and advocacy as we, we work through this difficult time. Um, my job's easy. I'm going to hang out and hopefully be there to answer questions along the way, but I get to introduce Dr. McGuine, who, who puts me to shame. He is a distinguished scientist in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He serves on the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. I think we lost Kevin. Wait, I will jump in until Kevin is able to get back and just um, uh, welcome all of the WIAA staff uh, who was able to join us on this call as well. You've already met uh, Wade Lebecki, Deputy Director, Todd Clark, our Communications Director. Assisting Todd is uh, Assistant Director Steph Hauser, and uh, Tom Shafransky is on the call, along with uh, Assistant Director Kate peterson Abiad and our Social Media uh, Coordinator, uh, Megan Loken. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> the wonders of technology inside the hospital clinic. Um, should I keep going, or did I Please. miss out? Okay. So... Um, Dr. McGuire's done numerous large studies, randomized trials that he's led and collected data from 300 high schools across the Midwest. He's enrolled 26,000 student athletes as his research participants. Um, and this work really has resulted in numerous invited presentations, publications, all at the national and international levels for sports medicine. Um, well over 30 peer-reviewed uh, documents and manuscripts. And many of these studies, he's actually gotten national awards of merit by the Sports Medicine Associations for the impact that they've had. Um, so personally, he's a great guy. And I think from the WIA SMAC point of view, having his research-based mind and focus has been so helpful because we all want to make informed decisions with data. And Dr. McGoin gives us the ability to do that. And it's not only data that we're pulling from national places, but it's really homegrown data that he starts and develops in Wisconsin. So it really helps us make much better and more educated decisions. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Dr. McGoin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the uh, uh, committee here to go ahead and, and get us involved. Um, I'm going to try to share my slides here. Can you see uh, my first slide? Yes. All right. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to look at this. So what we're, we're doing here is we're looking at the impact of school closures on sport cancellations and the health of Wisconsin adolescent athletes. And uh, full disclosure here, I'm a, I lead a research team of very talented individuals. Uh, six other members are uh, uh, researchers, child health experts, pediatricians, sports medicine experts that have really done a good job and, and really helped this study immensely. Uh, I have no financial disclosures to discuss or disclose. I'm not making any money on that. Uh, I am sports medicine advisory committee with the WA as well as the National Federation of High Schools. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, my focus in the last 20 years has been injury prevention, et cetera, um, in high school athletes, specifically in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, my goal also is also to think of these as a public health issue that I think we all know that, that high school athletics is such an important uh, uh, role in shaping the lives of young people, both in high school settings and beyond. We know that these transformative changes 
for kids playing high school sports to last long into their adult years. And I've always been impressed with that. So anything I think we can do to prevent injuries or keep kids involved in sports is a really good thing. So basically, um, you know, obviously we wanted to do this study looking at what was going on here in the state of Wisconsin over the last several months. We all know, you know, in March of 2020, uh, the Wisconsin schools were closed initially for a short period of time, that then it was extended for another short period of time, and eventually canceled to uh, encompass all the rest of the school year. And subsequently, we canceled all interscholastic sports. Now, um, while those are out of our hands and we couldn't control that, we do know that, you know, moving forward, there are some things we could maybe do to look at this further. Um, child health experts from the United States and around the world have talked about that these school closures and cancellations will really impact these kids and they hadn't really been studied. So we wanted to go ahead and try to do that here in Wisconsin. So our objective was to identify how the COVID-19 related school closures really impacted the health of these young kids. So for methods, what did we do? Well, we looked for research participants. We did by social media, we put postings out and followed up with mass emails. And we had 3,200 plus uh, high school athletes complete the uh, um, study for us. Um, there were some athletes that were not high school athletes. Uh, for example, we had a number of gymnasts that don't compete in high school, that just do club, then enrolled in some other few club sports as well. And we had great representation. 70, we had kids from 71 to 72 counties uh, complete the survey for us, which is really great because then we could show how it wasn't just affecting one or two counties, but was representative of, of the state as uh, we know it. Uh, the kids were asked to complete a short online survey, and we looked at the sports they participated in, whether they're great in school, boys, girls. Uh, we asked for their zip code and county as well to try to get some, again, demographic information. And so I think, uh, we don't know that. So we asked those questions. How are we determining what's going on in terms of the health of these young people? Well, there are a couple of things we did. Claudia Reardon, who's on the WIA SMAC and is a um, child health care specialist and MD, uh, talked about obtaining mental health questionnaire answers. So there were two questionnaires we answered. We asked one was seven questions, one was nine questions. These are scored that anxiety disorder is measured from zero to 21. A higher score indicates more anxiety. Uh, the patient health questionnaire is a measure of depression with 0 to 27 with higher scores equal higher levels of depression. We used a physical activity scale that's widely used in uh, that we've done before in the state of Wisconsin that scores athletes on a score a scale of 0 to 30 with higher scores equal physical activity. Then finally we looked at quality of life, an overall question of quality of life, what that would do. And again we looked at their physical health, their psychosocial health, and overall health these are scored on a zero to 100 scale with higher scores equaling better quality of life. So that's basically what we're trying to do and what we looked at in terms of that. Now you may say, well, what did you do in the past? So you've got this information now. What are you comparing it to? We had collected data on depression, physical activity, and quality of life over the last five years on over 5,000 Wisconsin athletes for different studies we did. So we knew we already had this control data or data from kids in schools in the last several years. We thought, well, if we collect data now, we could compare it to those previous kids to go ahead and, and uh, see what changes were taking place. And we had a good representation. As I said, we, we looked at the sport participation. The sports were, were uh, equalized and really representative of what we see in terms of overall participants in the state of Wisconsin. And then we were able to do some things statistically where uh, we know exactly in 2019 how many football players we were, we knew how many football players there are now. Answering our survey, we could then formulate that to create really representative responses to know that we were really capturing what was going on with these kids. So overall, if we look at uh, some results, real quickly, um, here's a measure of, of anxiety. Now, the anxiety scores were pretty high. They were over nine which means is a, a, a pretty a big issue. But we can also score these anxiety measures by categorical values. So, so a score below five is considered, they have minimal or no anxiety. Scores of five or above means they have mild or moderate or even severe anxiety, which is interesting. So if we look at that, 65% of our population of high school athletes completed the survey reported anxiety symptoms when schools and sports were out. So in May, and it's interesting, 25% had 
had moderate or severe anxiety. And so that was stunning in itself that we saw this first response that, wow, something's going on here. That two thirds of the kids are, are reporting uh, anxiety levels. And why is that important? So as again, talking to Claudia Reardon, uh, our specialist in this area, she said, Tim, if they score five or above, we would want to get them medical intervention. Well, 65% of the kids did report a score of five or above. Unfortunately, we didn't have anxiety to compare it in previous studies. So we're gonna look at that and um, the other scale, scales moving forward. This slide shows uh, the prevalence of depression symptoms in our adolescent athletes. The yellow bars are the data we collected in the last five years. So the yellow bars are representative of the 5,000 kids we looked at in the numerous studies in, in the state of Wisconsin. And if we look at um, just real categorically, the average scores prior to uh, school closing, a, a depression score was three, which means it's very low. They have no pathologies. The scores, the average score in our group was almost nine in this group. And if we look at these categorical values, we see two thirds again of these athletes are reporting some level of mild or moderate to severe anxiety. They had scores over five, which means that something significant is going on here, not just like the anxiety. We saw depression scores much higher than we anticipated we would ever see. And this is three and a half times higher than we had seen previously in our, in our samples of high school athletes in Wisconsin. This next slide shows physical activity scores. Again, this is a, a scale we use. It scored from zero to 30. Uh, the average scores for the kids in Wisconsin in the last several years uh, is almost 25. So they're sitting pretty high. They've got good at physical activity levels. And we see that in May, the red bar represents the score, the physical activity scores for these kids in, in May. So now we saw this about approximately a 50% decrease. We saw this consistently over both boys and girls that their physical activity decreased by 50%, which is significant. And I'll tie that back into some of the other issues we're getting. So it's interesting because that activity score is such that we see when we have kids post-surgery where they're not doing much of anything. They have a very low activity score. And here we had healthy, pretty healthy kids in May who would normally be high school athletes reporting scores that were very low, 50% lower than we'd ever seen before. Here's an example of the quality of life. Why is quality of life important? Now this is it's kind of unique measures not used often in sports, but it's important because we can compare different pathologies. So quality of life scores are used for all ages, for all disabilities and conditions or diseases. And we can get good values. And we know that a high quality of life score is good because in the short term, it means they're healthy. But in the long term, these people stay healthier longer, they live longer, we spend less on their health care throughout their lifespan with a high quality of life score. We have three scores that we represent here. We have a physical health score on the left. The middle is a psychosocial, that's emotional, school, and social health. And then the overall health was a combination of the two. Again, the yellow bars are representing what we found three or four years ago. The red bars are the scores for what we found in May of 2020. Physical health obviously was down quite a bit the psychosocial health, the bars in the middle, we see a, a steep decline. Again, we think that's reinforcing the um, mental um, health issues that we've seen with anxiety and depression. And overall here, the overall quality of life score is dramatically lower. It's, it's so low, we've never seen this type of score drop ever in, in high school athletes. And so that's a real brief summary of those major findings of that study. Well, you know, I guess now we go, what does this all mean? So, okay, so you're seeing these things. Can you put these in context? Can we add some meat to the bones here and further uh, describe what's going on? Well, what we're saying, these school closures and sport cancellations are associated with the worsening health, physical activity, and quality of life of these kids. Prior, prior to this, we had no data showing anywhere in the United States what was happening with adolescent athletes. And we think that these psychosocial effects will uh, really impact not just these kids now, but our healthcare spending and how we deal with as a community and culture going forward in the state of Wisconsin. And I want to make a point here. We did get some feedback. I did get some questioning emails from parents or concerned people. Uh, why aren't you studying all people? Why aren't you studying all the students? Why are you just focusing on kids? Or my, my son or daughter is, is a, a 
a drama participant or forensics or a band participant, why aren't you worried about those kids? I'm not saying we're not worried about those kids. I think that's very important to also study what's going on in all the student athletes, whether they do core curriculars or not. I'm just saying we had great data on athletes, so we knew moving forward, we wanted to collect data to compare to the previous athletic samples we had and not make generalizations for non-athletes as well. All right now, if we, if we uh, further add some value to these numbers, right now we're estimating, based on our calculations, 66, th 66,000 or two thirds of the Wisconsin um, interscholastic athletes were at risk for depression. So right off the bat, that, that's quite high. In the short term, we know these mental health issues and disorders impact whether these kids use alcohol, drugs, you know, opioids, whether they stay in school, engage with their peers, engage with teachers, or even graduate. So we know there's a huge issue in the short term with these kids. In the long term, these disorders can become chronic. They influence whether these individuals go on to college, uh, uh, develop a meaningful career, long-term relationships, healthy relationships, or chronically use drugs or alcohol as self-treatment throughout their life. So mental health is not just a one-off where it's affecting these kids in the short term. The mental health experts I work with say that the disorders that manifest themselves in youth and adolescence really become problems, not just then, but later in life. So, and that, like I said, we know previous studies have talked about that, that prolonged quarantines or, or issues where you lock people down that does impact mental health. And the CDC recommends that if you look on their guidelines of school closures, they mention that short-term school closures or a day or two would have minimal effect, but they, they admit that if you have a long-term closure over two weeks, expect to have anxiety issues coming up with these kids. This is also important because we know that schools play an important role and providing access for mental health services. As I like to point out that if, if I have two professional parents or two parents working or, or here in Madison, I, I deal with maybe couples or professors, if their son or daughter has issues with depression or anxiety, they will seek medical help and intervention from professional colleagues or from a clinic referral or to a local hospital. Um, for disadvantaged kids, kids from lower socioeconomic situations, they're most likely to go to the schools for this intervention. And we've taken that away. You know, we have, we have this case where these kids may be impacted to a great degree and the important role of the school counselors, et cetera, in, in providing this help, uh, we've denied it from the situation. So we have to recognize that these are long-term. Well, that's, that's mental health. What about physical activity? As I mentioned that these scores were 50% lower than we've ever reported. And you have to understand that it's closely related. This physical activity has a beneficial effect on the wide range of health outcomes in athletes. We know they do better in a lot of things if they're physically active. And uh, right now, if you talk to providers, medical providers, they will talk about the importance of exercise and organized sports as an intervention to help kids get over depression, get over anxiety, that these are things, physical activity is closely related. And we think that um, our low mental health scores are undoubtedly related and closely related and are mixed to the low physical activity scores. This is compounded also by the fact that just the fact that we're, you can't turn on the news today without being chronically depressed, you know, just looking what's going on and what's being said about the pandemic. And so we already know we have a high level of anxiety and depression built in. And then without giving these kids an outlet of sports and physical activity, we're building on that mental health or anxiety because of that. And we also think that moving forward, that these issues are gonna be manifested to a greater degree the longer we keep kids out of sports and exercise opportunities. And so we have to notice that if we continue through the 2021 uh, school year, we can expect low levels of physical activity to manifest themselves and more levels of mental health issues. Quality of life, as I said, we saw some very low quality of life scores Here's a, a bar graph that shows what we've collected in the last several years. So the far left column, you see a column called healthy athletes. These are scores from athletes all over the state of Wisconsin. So about 95, as I mentioned. The second bar represents kids that had a concussion. So we had measured kids, the quality of life for kids that had a severe concussion, were out of school, were out of sports, and uh, didn't get back to sports maybe for a week or two or, or 14 days or even three weeks. Those scores are about 88 and that. Non-athletes, kids that, that don't participate in any athletics, their scores are even lower than that. 
And here we are sitting in May of 2020, we have this round or this uh, red bar, that's the scores for there. So putting in context, we're seeing that. I did some background work, I did some literature reviews and found that um, these scores were the only higher, the only group they were higher than were kids with chronic in, um, injuries or illnesses. So we know that kids with childhood cancer, cerebral palsy, diabetes, serious, serious health issues have quality of life scores that are 74, 75. Our quality of life scores for our kids in Wisconsin were not much higher in May. So that's also got, a, got an issue. And again, it's all related to what we're seeing there. So overall, um, just real briefly, we, we, we want to reiterate that these COVID-19 related school closures and cancellations are associated with significant, significant negative impacts on the health and well-being of these athletes. And I said, moving forward, I think it's imperative that public health experts work with school administrators, school officials, coaches, teachers, whatever, and consider the benefits and risks of considered of uh, contain or of continuing the prolonged school closures. That it's not just about preventing an illness or injury. Um, it's a trade in terms of what we're doing to stop the spread of a of, a, of this viral infection has other unintended impacts. And there's not a formula that's that one size fits all for all schools, all districts, all counties in the state of Wisconsin. But I think we need to be aware that there's benefits and risks of continuing these closures and cancellations uh, through the next school year. So this is my contact information. I'll, I'll um, end with that. Um, and I think uh, we can go to Wade or the rest of the WA and uh, or Todd and go to some questions. Okay, we have a couple questions for Dr. McGuire. One is from Jeff. Uh, were you able to control for just general anxiety due to COVID-19 or compared to non-athletes? Team athletics and in particular competition will likely increase the risk of introducing COVID-19 to schools and thus may increase the chance of closure. How would you increase school closures affect mental health of the much higher number of non-athlete students? Yeah. That, that's a great question. Could we tease that out? Uh, the short answer is no for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, because it could be school closures, it could be cancellations. It could be, as somebody said, the economic uncertainty we're facing right now. As you said, you know, some kids may report depression and anxiety levels related to the fact that the unemployment rate went from 3% to over 12% in a month. And so that could be, so teasing that out would be difficult. Um, I do know, uh, again, as somebody yeah. said, maybe you're overestimating the fact that you're saying these athletes are having these issues. Um, I've had other people say, Tim, you might be underestimating it because uh, you're capturing kids. And, and again, we have good representation from counties across the state of Wisconsin, but on a per capita basis, the kids from the counties in the, in the lowest median household income or the highest rates of poverty, we had fewer of those kids answer our surveys as opposed to kids in the high level. So we can't tease it out uh, between closures, economics, uh, cancellations of sports, but we, we know that's a limitation with this or anything. If we would have had data from five years ago, we maybe could have done that. Tim, can you um, stop sharing your screen so we can see you? All right. Thank you. There you go. So now let's have another place. question. Uh, this is from Corey from Southern Door. Uh, will you be doing a follow-up study when school sports resume to compare and contrast? Yes. Um, and of course, uh, I always said, uh, we're always asking for money. We're looking for money right now to study that. We're looking uh, at, because as you just mentioned about, was it school closures, sport cancellations, or both or a combination thereof? We're trying to get money to study this moving forward in Wisconsin to look at Maybe we're going to have some schools with just schools and some schools with schools and sports and do those different things. So yes, we do have a follow-up study plan now to look at how reopening changes and affects that. And I also should say that we have data, not just in Wisconsin. We have 10,000 kids from outside of Wisconsin, this as well. So we're trying to, to interest some natural. We're basically scouring funding sources to go ahead and continue this line of research. Second question, what can we do? Question uh, from Art from the Wisconsin State Journal. What recommend recommendations do you have for those who must judge between 
A, resuming sports to benefit student athletes' mental and physical health with B, increasing the chance that they might pass COVID-19 to others in their circle, some of whom may face life-threatening consequences as a result. That, that is a big issue. And you know, as I said, we always talk about benefits and risks. Most of the time I do that within the in terms of sports injuries and concussions. They say the benefits uh, uh, of, of playing football to me far outweigh the risks of having a serious concussion and life altering effects. Um, so we make that effect. And so the trade is, is somewhat easier for kids because they make it a one-to-one -one trade. It's like, does that parent or kid want to accept that? But this is different. The chance we could spread this disease, um, that changes the dynamic quite a bit. I, I do know, I looked at the latest uh, uh, American Academy of Physicians, physician statement talked about getting kids in school. And they did mention that there was, there's uh, a growing body of evidence that not only are these kids uh, least likely to get this uh, virus, they seem to be less likely to pass it on. And so that's important because there were, there were studies back in uh, April looking at worldwide and showed that school closures did not have a meaningful impact on the infection or death rates in those things. So the idea that I understand, I don't want to um, put people at risk, elderly people at risk for getting back to sports. At the same time, we have to understand there might be some compromise that we can do. Is there a way to get kids involved and still protect our most vulnerable? I hope we can work on that. Some communities have already talked about it. Some communities are, are say it's gonna to be too hard. I've had emails asking me why I wanna kill kids by talking and getting into sports. I've had emails saying, uh, if even talking about getting kids in sport would put their grandmother at a nursing home at risk. Uh, from a personal standpoint, that, that's a very you know, risk or issue with me as well. Um, I'm crawling into the age where the comorbidities are, are increasing. I worked with high school athletes for a long time. I've had occasional bouts of immunosuppressant therapies. I have a 92 year old family member in a long term care facility. Um, I would not want to take anything that would to do that. But my also answer to that is I think we can protect my family member in the long term care facility and still let kids get back to sports. As I said, in fact, the facility is right across the, the, the school, right across the road from a school where they normally have kids playing soccer and softball all summer. And I said, uh, the safety hasn't been impacted at all by not having kids play this year because the nursing home lockdown, they have procedures in place to do that. I'm hoping we can get there and find that compromise to do both. And Dr. Walter, I would invite you to um, unmute yourself and, and do you have um, some information on the AAP position that came out? Yeah, I think Tim summed it up nicely is, is I mean, the hard part with this, right, is, is we don't really know what next month brings. And so being able to predict what's going to happen in August is impossible, I would argue. Um, we just know that WIAA has partnered with DHS and it's really reassuring to me even to look in my own community in the suburbs of Milwaukee where the school districts are putting together um, community task force to discuss reopening schools. And so the conversations are happening where we're doing our best to minimize risk to all of these kids and these athletes and our community, um, but also recognizing as we've talked about that, that there is risk to not being in school. There is risk to not playing sports. And these decisions are difficult, um, but I'm really confident with what we're doing at the WIA level to improve safety as best we can for our athletes and our communities and really having conversations about keeping that risk as low as possible. But it, you know, it, with life, we cannot eliminate risk and there's going to be hard, difficult discussions and decisions in the future. Um, but we can't predict that because we don't know what's going to happen come August or September. So right now we've got a wonderful plan for summer and we start discussing plans for fall and go from there. Okay, we got another question from Rob Hernandez of Wisconsin.golf. Golf is an activity that boys golfers whose season was canceled were able to play with friends on a recreational business during the pandemic. 
What data or findings can you share that compare athletes in sports such as golf that could be played with those whose sports could not be played due to lockdown or of facilities or there's being a team sport? You know, I don't, uh, we're, we're teasing out some of the sport numbers as we speak, not just here, but nationally and looking at, at what was uh, going on. Um, that's a great question. Could some of these individuals get doing some things? Um, unfortunately, um, we don't have a large sample. We, we lost like a thousand kids who played, who did track, completed our survey, but only 30 kids that did golf. So we don't have a good sample enough to really make strong recommendations, but looking at sports and other factors, um, I think are, are is something that we also need to look at. And as we go forward with our further research papers, we hope to do. Got a question from Greg and Durand. How would you respond to the person that questions why we have to socially distance during the school day and then go play full contact football as soon as school is over? So, yeah, I'll jump in. So I think even if full contact football um, practice will be different, you know, it won't look like it has in years past because there will need to be um, hygiene, disinfecting, some social distance, potentially practicing in pods, ideally um, coaches wearing masks when they can't socially distance. Obviously in games, they'll be closer together. Um, the school day will have more prolonged close contact. I mean, when you play football, you are tackling someone and you are close to someone for a small period of time. When you are sitting next to them at the classroom desk, you are next to that person for eight hours of the day. Um, and so it's a little bit different, a lot of it different, I think. Um, but I think, again, when we think of football and sport as it historically was, how we practice is going to look different and we need to be a little bit safer um, in doing that. And that's the hope of all these discussions. And as data comes from Dr. McGuine and other groups around the country, taking that data and using it to create best practices for how to keep things safe in school for sports but not only for the athletes, safe in school for all the students, theater, clubs, PE class, et cetera. Got a, another question from Zach uh, from Unity. Would it be your finding based on this study that the potential damages outweigh the potential dangers? Go ahead, please. That's the that's a ten million dollar question. As I said, that's the trade we're always making. Uh, you know, I, I and and I I don't know. And each community may have to answer that differently. It, different districts, different counties may have different risks going on and do that. I know what I think. As I as I said, I think it's fair to say I think we can accommodate uh, some sports getting forward, getting schools in, growing and and doing this because I I do and, and I will. I'll be honest, I've had contacts with people who have said that. I had a, a school uh, coach, teacher, uh, basically said they would never go back. Uh, they would sue if they had to go back uh, because they didn't feel safe for the next several years. I had a, a coach, uh, I'll be honest, you know, an older coach, probably been coaching for 40 years and had, by his own admission, overweight, cardiac issues, high blood pressure, and stated it wouldn't be fair to let kids go back to sports because he couldn't coach. And my answer to that is like me dealing with kids. Um, I think I have to mitigate my risks and do what I can to, to keep me safe. But I think it's unfair for me to say that kids can't play sports because I can't be on the sidelines. That's just my opinion. Some people may feel differently. I feel that way. Again, I feel that if, uh, if I had a family member at home you know, maybe an immunosuppressant state or say had a transplant or, or cancer treatment, you know, those coaches may not want to get involved. And I understand that. Uh, but that was, those benefit risk ratios, those trade-offs have to be made at an individual and district level. Dr. McGuire, we have a question from Ryan in Marshfield regarding middle and high school level sports during the upcoming school year. What are the medical advisor's thoughts on the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance that suggests secondary schools should adhere to physical distancing strategies with particular 
avoidance of close proximity in cases of increased exhalation, which is singing and exercise. You know, I'll let Kevin do this because Kevin's the, the liaison there. Yes, so, so actually yesterday, the American Academy of Pediatrics released their statement with schools um, saying that the physical or social distancing, whichever you want to call it, between students and adults should remain at six feet. Um, but they dropped it from student to student to three feet. So again, as we find out more, we're recognizing that the rate that kids pass this on to each other appears to be less. Um, and the rate that kids are symptomatic appears to be less and the rate that kids get severe illness appears to be less. Um, again, that may change. Could the virus mutate? Will we learn new data in the future? Maybe, we don't know. Um, but as of now, when we're talking about having kids um, closer together, at least the American Academy of Pediatrics and their um, think tank behind it feels that that is safe and appropriate. Um, so again, as you look at singing, exercise, heavy breathing, that disperses more of that aerosol cloud out. Um, and so there is probably some increased risk with that. That is, again, talking about, well, how do we minimize that as best possible? Um, and those are discussions that will be had as we continue to learn more. Could that source be made public? I'm not familiar with the three foot change in recommendation. Yeah, I can uh, try and find the link and pass it on to Wade and Dave. Dr. Walter, just to be, wasn't the three feet distance also based on wearing a mask? The, uh, yes, the three foot distance is masked in, in classrooms. And a reminder, to please use the chat for your questions and answers, please. We do have a question from Donna. One question about kids not likely to passing COVID to others. What age defines this lower risk of spread? As we know, high school kids are 19 and 18 years old and physically bigger than many adults. We are, I think, still trying to figure out the risk level, but you know, when you look at decades of life, um, low 20s, teens, younger, are very low risk uh, for severe illness with COVID. Okay. And someone just posted the link so thank you to whoever posted the link to that article. All right, looking through a couple other questions here. Was there any information in the study that indicated the causation of the increased levels of anxiety and depression? And again, apologize if you missed it early on. Yeah, I yeah, no, we talked about that. Can we purely delineate what's sport cancellation versus school closure versus combination of versus the the general anxiety of the depression the uh, disease or the economic impact we we can't look at that uh, right now again as we move forward with our next sets of studies and we start to go in and we, we can get some kids in school in sports some school kids in school without sports we might be able to delineate some of those issues a little a little bit further Here's a question from Reese at WSAW, and maybe this is a question for Wade or Dave. How is the WIA going to use this data moving forward? How much of an urgency does it put on making sure sports start in the fall? Well, we have asked our um, psychiatrist, Dr. Reardon, and our psychologist, Dr. Merrick, to go ahead and provide some resources, and those are on the website underneath health slash mental wellness and health. Um, so we've, what we're trying to do, and we focused on with the Sports Medical Advisory the last three years, probably on our mental wellness of our athletes, knowing that they are sub, sometimes subject to more anxiety, more depression due to the expectations they have of themselves. So we've been using this information 
uh, to go ahead and provide resources to our schools uh, so they can have uh, some resources for the parents and the coaches to the kids. And then we have some resources for the kids as well. I would add that, um, <clears throat> Todd, that uh, we recognize that uh, a school has many responsibilities to a community. Uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot separate out or tease away uh, the importance of, of a school and, and the overarching relationship uh, that they have with that community. Uh, in, in, many, in, in many different directions, uh, from the economic impact uh, upon a community to, um, you know, the, 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 the social and mental health of that community. But when I boil things down uh, for myself and the staff here at the WIAA, I think back to uh, having been a, a school athletics administrator and my job then, as I view our job now, was primarily, first and foremost, to take care of kids. Uh, we, we recognize uh, many and, and broad uh, other responsibilities, but number one, we, we boil it down to uh, what is it that we might do that is, that is best for the kids that, uh, that you as a school will serve, and we as one of those support organizations, um, one of the offspring, if you will, of uh, this membership of schools, what can we do to help provide our members with uh, the best information and, and resources that we can? And it is data and research like this, like we have heard today, that we have heard um, in the weeks and months since schools closed, since every state in the, in the United States canceled uh, the remainder of their winter sport programs and, and most of us, uh, their spring sports seasons as well. We did that focused on the, the urgency at the time that uh, as a country, as a state, we needed to afford our healthcare providers a few minutes to catch up to what was uh, exploding and impacting upon all of us. And now in, you know, as we have progressed a little bit further along this ever changing trail, we are hearing and recognizing this adverse impact upon students. And right now, as we shared with the uh, Assembly Education Committee, right now it is that, uh, that negative impact on students that we begin seeing emerging in, uh, in Dr. McGuine's research and I suspect in, in other research that will be forthcoming that is driving our, our primary focus and position right now. Uh, admittedly, there, will be, there are questions that we are not able to answer in, in this minute. Uh, as I said, this is ever changing, rapidly changing. But we will be doing, as I, as I shared with the assembly committee, everything possible that if our member schools are open and if they choose to have a, a sports season and wish to have a tournament, the staff of the WIAA will do everything to be in position to help support that. So we're using this research. Uh, it, is, it is shaping, it has caught our attention and it, we are using it daily to, uh, to guide the decisions that we're making here. Okay, and related, I've got a, uh, a comment from Heidi Stewart. Thank you for all your work on this. This is just one cohort that is suffering the negative impacts of COVID-19. The mental, physical, and other impacts must be considered as we move forward. We must find a way to begin to move back to our normal. New normal. And then I have a question from Mitch. Were other factors taken into account such as parents' job loss, furlough or working from home while teaching their own children, increase in substance abuse and domestic abuse? Is it safe to say the closure of schools and cancellation of sports wouldn't be the only factors in the study's results? You know, as, as I've touched on previously, yeah, we think there's multiple factors. Um, to get at some of those issues, I know researchers that are doing some in-depth dives, um, 
qualitative type research and looking at all those factors um, to go ahead and look at those other issues. You know, with the family dynamics, how did they change what's going on? Um, the social or the economic impact on the family, all those issues. Yeah, this was just, you know, this is a snapshot of these athletes as we know and what we could control for. In fact, we couldn't ask specific question about drug use or alcohol use or anything that was illegal. Our, we, we couldn't even ask those type of questions. So it'd be great, we're gonna know. And again, this is gonna be one piece of the puzzle and we hope those other pieces of the puzzle come in and help create the entire picture here as we move forward. Okay, I got a question from Mitch at Mineral Point. If only a few schools in the conference decide to compete, how will that affect competition and schedules and the WI tournaments, I guess, or Dave or Wade. I'll go ahead. My, my, my response was going to be, Mitch, it's, it's so far out right now um, that we haven't been able to uh, really fully grasp what we're going to be doing then. We want to get through our contact period um, and see if our schools can offer some um, ways for our kids to connect back up with their school, their coaches, and their teammates. Uh, this study has shown us that that's an important factor. The other reason that uh, we want to get through our, our, our contact period and, and have some contact with the kids is it can go ahead and show us what we can and can't do. Uh, the sports specific information that our sport directors put out uh, in, a, in a sport medical review is, uh, is very good. Uh, it covers uh, what you're currently at for your county risk level. So if your county is low, then you can go into that area and sports specific and see examples of drills and, and things that you coaches can do with the kids. If your county level is high, then you can go into uh, that sports specific area and find out which uh, exercises and drills can be done with low exposure. So you can still connect with those kids. And as we get into the closer to fall, then we'll be able to address those situations where a, a conference might be from five different counties and have five different uh, uh, risk levels and, and uh, how we're going to deal with that. Dave, you wanted to go on? Yeah, I would uh, only add, Mitch, that um, it certainly is worth having advanced conversations as a conference. Uh, as conference uh, administrators, as conference athletics directors, and to see if there is um, some common ground uh, as a conference that you are able to uh, identify uh, under a number of different hypothetical scenarios. In my communication to uh, the district administrators last week, I pointed out the language in the WIAA bylaws that, uh, that provide uh, somewhat of a starting point for all of us. And we, we, I think it's important to recognize that uh, even within the uncertain times that we find ourselves in, the fundamentals of, uh, of our membership bylaws and student eligibility and so on haven't just been cast aside or, or thrown out the door. Uh, when we have been able to identify areas that need emergency relief, like the academic eligibility for fall, uh, like the, uh, the, the backlog in access to healthcare and the sport physical for young people, our board of control has been extremely responsive to staff recommendations or the guidance from our medical advisory, and they have been right on top of those things. So we will begin with what this membership has put in place for, ex for school closures. And then if, as we learn as we go, other decisions need to be made to find um, reasonable relief in some circumstances, then those are conversations that, uh, that will occur when, um, uh, when those questions must be answered. I can tell you that uh, a number of different hypotheticals are discussed in this office uh, every day. Uh, those same hypotheticals are uh, being talked about across the Midwest between myself and this staff and other uh, state association directors and executives. And so we are all, all of us uh, in the same boat looking to how best to answer some of those questions. 
but I would reemphasize that our bylaws uh, and that segment which was shared with everyone is uh, the place that we would begin from. Okay, we have a question from Lance uh, Bagstad. With the idea of regional openings for the sports being discussed, what are the current thoughts of the WIA staff regarding hosting a tournament series if some schools or conferences compete and others do not, either by choice or by county health department order? As I have already said, if we have members who are open and, uh, and want to have a regular season, we will do all within, uh, uh, all within our uh, ability to, to help that, uh, th those opportunities go forward. If our members are open and desire to have a tournament opportunity, uh, until such a time as our board of control would, would point us in a different direction or give us different marching orders, we will do all that we can to provide a tournament opportunity for those members who are open and would desire one. Uh, that being said, there will uh, most likely uh, in, a, in a scenario uh, that uh, Lance has described, need to be some adjustment to tournament procedures and, and those sorts of things. But again, we will begin with the, with the fundamentals as outlined for tournament opportunities within our bylaws. Um, perhaps there will be considerations uh, made, certainly in regular season, those are local control and the tournament opportunities. You know, what can be done? Uh, what are the situations at, uh, at an impacted school? Uh, that we might be able to reasonably, um, you know, keep that tournament moving forward. But uh, if if members are open, uh, we will we are we are working and planning on having a tournament opportunity for those that desire one. Got a question from Craig Hoffman of the Tri County News. With some colleges already shutting down fall sports, are we aware of any school districts in the state that have already stated they will not resume fall sports regardless of our decision? I am not. Any other staff? Wade, anyone? I am not familiar with anybody at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from, from Nicole. I am understanding this discussion correctly that WIA will be leaving the decision to the district as to whether a district holds a fall sports season rather than making a statement or a statewide ruling to close fall sports very similar to that which was done for spring sports. That is correct. Okay, have a uh, question from Steve Bowsley. The more we can act in a uniform and consistent way, the better off this will be for all. We would like to prepare as if athletes will resume in August. Fall sports will be the first exposure students and parents will have with our local districts. Doing this collectively and doing it right is essential. We are looking to WI for continued guidance on how we can make this occur. Just a comment. Jeff Walters has a question. Was there any conversation about moving lower contact sports to the fall season and higher contact sports to later in the year? Uh, those have been uh, anecdotal and sidebar sorts of conversations that uh, you know, have been uh, brought up in this office, they have not. Uh, they have not been carried over uh, more broadly to any of any discussion with our board of control or those committees that advise us or the board to this point in time. To this point in time, while it has been uh, chatted about informally with other with other state offices. To the best of my knowledge, there is uh, no one heading in that direction right now. Question from uh, uh, David, will the WIA provide a template of guidelines for participation in fall activities, similar to what they provided for the summer activities? 
I anticipate that we will be expanding upon what we already have. Uh, Dr. Walter, what were your thoughts on how we were going to adopt or adapt those guidelines to the uh, fall? Yeah, I would expect that <clears throat> we reconvene the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee and discuss based on emerging data and evidence and studies, where do we go from here? And again, it's, it's I feel like a broken record, but what we learn over the next month is about coronavirus is, is, is hopefully going to be helpful with informing us for how we can make fall safer and minimize that risk to all of our students and communities. So I, I would hope that we're gonna put together some guidelines for minimizing risk, improving safety for each sport in the fall. Um, but I would anticipate that's gonna happen probably sometime in July as we look forward to getting more information. The more, this is the hardest thing, right? It's, it's rapidly changing as we've all said. The more data we get, the more information we have, the better recommendations and advice we can give. Okay, and you know, we'd like to uh, wrap it up. I wanna thank um, Drs. McGuire and Walter for their time and knowledge. Um, Dave, uh, any closing comments? On this, uh, first off, thanks to, uh, to uh, our panelists, uh, Dr. Walter and, uh, and Dr. McGuire for, for joining us uh, on this relative short notice, coming back from family vacation and, and jumping in to, uh, to make time for our membership and, and others who may be listening on. We recognize that there are, are countless other questions and, and must acknowledge that some of the questions we're simply not able to have answers to at, uh, at, this minute in, at this minute in time, other than uh, the people who are a part of this WIAA Sport Medical Advisory Committee, the people who make up, who are listening to this call, who make up this WIAA membership, along with this executive staff, uh, will work tirelessly uh, to do the best that we can, to the best that we can identify on behalf of this membership of schools, and the students that uh, all of you serve. We need to recognize that some of the, the challenge in responding to the questions, the many questions that all of us have, it simply is not avoidance. Uh, it, it's not uh, an unwillingness to try to answer. The legal pad that I'm flashing up on the screen right now, uh, the notes are, are dated March 9th. It was a Monday of uh, this past March uh, 2020. Uh, Monday evening, uh, we wrapped up a call with the CDC. The state executives were on uh, with the CDC. Dr. Ian Williams on March 9th, and we had our girls basketball tournament starting on Thursday. And on March 9th, some of the important conversations and, uh, and questions, and that was a time when there were 500 cases of COVID in, in the United States, 19 deaths at that time. There were 100,000 uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus worldwide. And the questions were asked about, do we need to cancel mass gatherings? And the answer was no. And, uh, and at least not from the guidance and direction of the CDC at that point in time. So we wrapped up that call at about 5 p.m., 5.30 Monday evening. And the closing remarks of the CDC at that time were, don't be scared, but be prepared. And that's when we came forward with the reminders about knowing your, your personal risk and social distancing, washing hands, covering your cough, and that sort of thing. And so between Monday at 5 o'clock with absolutely no concerns by Wednesday night, uh, of that same week. Um, the NBA canceled uh, the remainder of their season. The, uh, on, on Thursday morning early, we, we learned that the NCAA was canceling the, its uh, tournament and Final Four. Uh, Major League Baseball had suspended play. We had gone from uh, no restrictions on, uh, on our spring tournaments to now only being allowed to have uh, 80 people from each team 
and each program able to enter some of our tournament venue buildings. And that was Wednesday night, so we adjusted on Thursday morning on the run and on the fly. By Thursday afternoon, we were told that uh, there was no way, shape, or form. Uh, some of our venues would even allow our, our next weeks of tournaments uh, to be held. And so we recognize that uh, the nature of this virus has been and likely will continue to be rapidly changing. But within that, uh, we are doing the best that uh, all of us are able to by hearing from experts like Dr. McGuine and Dr. Walter uh, and, and to heed their guidance uh, and incorporate their guidance to the best of our ability to continue to serve the students that uh, are the, the number one and primary recipients of all of our attention. With that, I, I would like to say thank you again to all who have joined in this call and this conversation, and we will continue to be in touch and we will continue to utilize all of the resources available to us to re continue to respond uh, to your questions, as well as put together the best guidance we can under whatever the circumstances are that at the present time. Stay healthy, stay well, and thank you for joining us. And again, Dr. McGuine's uh, PDF is on our website under health, uh, infectious diseases, and his contact information is at the back of that PowerPoint. Thank you very much.